His plan is he's going to go home and he's going to make a speech to his father that sounds repentant, but what his plan is is this. I'm going to go home and I'm going to say, Dad, I completely messed this up, so let me live with the servants. You pay me a wage and I will save all of that money up until finally I've got enough to pay you back and then maybe we can talk about me and your son again. Do you know what that is? That is salvation by good works. That is a young man who thinks that the best way he can get back into the affections of his father is by working really, really hard. He's planning to go back, not ask for the mercy of the father, not ask for forgiveness. He's going to go back and he is going to work hard until he has saved all the money to repay. And then maybe we can talk about being loved and being part of the family once again. And he's underestimated by doing that three major things. He's underestimated the magnitude of the amount of money he's lost. He's he's underestimated the magnitude of the debt that he owes. He's underestimating the reaction of the father. Because why on earth would a father even want a son back like that? And he's underestimated the way that the rest of the village is going to respond. I'll come back to the village in a minute. But what I want us to realize is that Jesus crafts the story so powerfully because what he's doing is he's showing a contrast between religion on one hand and grace on the other. You see, religion is spelt D-O. It's what I do. It's the good works that I think I need to do in order to satisfy a holy God. And so many people around the world and all of the religions of the world, ultimately you boil them all down, they are spelt by two words, two letters, D-O. Whether it's the eight pillars, uh, sorry, the five pillars of Islam, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and many forms of Christianity is all about what do I have to do? What boxes do I have to check? What list do I have to uh, finish up? What acts do I need to perform in order for God to love me? It's salvation by good works. Grace is not spelt D-O. It is spelt D-O-N-E. Done. Because under grace, my acceptance and my adoption and my forgiveness by God is not based on what I do. It is based on what Jesus has done for me. And that is the huge difference, friends, between religion and grace, between religion and biblical Christianity. It's not about what you and I do. It's about what Jesus has done on our behalf and coming in faith to Jesus and accepting his incredible gift. And that's what this boy hasn't understood. He's planning to come back to his father and say, let me work off my debt. The problem is his debt's so enormous. He could live till he's 300 and still not have enough years to get all that money together. And so many of us, I think, we we think that we need to operate and relate to God based on our works and our obedience. Now, good works and obedience are good things, but they are a response to his incredible grace to us through Jesus. They're not how we earn a relationship because we can never earn a relationship with God. We are given it as a gift of pure grace through what Jesus has done. So this is not a story of a son's repentance. Now you may say, well, hold on a minute. Doesn't he say there, he's going to go back and say to his father in verse 18, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Well, it sounds repentant, doesn't it? So busy Jesus is a rabbi who knows the Old Testament scriptures inside out. And standing at the back of the crowd of ordinary people, standing right at the back, is all the religious leaders of Israel who hate him. And they're experts in the Old Testament, and they would have been standing at the back of the crowd with their arms crossed and a scowl on their face. And I think Jesus puts this bit in here because he's quoting from the Old Testament book of Exodus. Do you know who said, I have sinned against heaven? The Pharaoh of Egypt said those words. Jesus is quoting from a man whose heart was hardened before God. Those are not words of repentance. They are words of manipulation. See, this is not a story of a son's repentance. Remember, this is one of three stories. And in the first story, 
The lost sheep doesn't suddenly go, meh, I'm lost. I'm going to wander home. No, no, no. The sheep doesn't wander home. The shepherd goes and looks for the sheep, yeah? And the second story, the coin isn't sitting in a crack somewhere in the corner of the house and suddenly go, man, this is dumb. I'm going to be lost here forever. The coin doesn't roll out. The woman searches the house until she finds the coin. The shepherd finds the lost sheep. The woman finds the lost coin. And in this story, the father finds his lost boy. That's what's going on in this story. So here's what happens. Verse 20. We already read the first line. So he got up and he went to his father. Here's what happens next. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him and he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. I love the way that Jesus piles verb after verb after verb here. Five verbs in one sentence. This is what the father does. does. He sees and he's filled and he runs and he throws and he hugs. It's like the father can't wait. He's found his boy. Now earlier I said one of the things that the son has not taken into consideration is the reaction of his village. You see, in Jesus' day they had a custom When a wayward child would so humiliate the family, the village would then take it upon themselves to protect that family if that wayward son or daughter ever came home. And so what would happen is they would enact a ceremony that in Aramaic or Hebrew was called the kitsetsa. And what would happen is if a wayward son came home like this boy, who was deeply humiliated and hurt his family, if someone in the village saw them coming... They would quickly rally the entire village around them. And the entire village would go out to the roadway leading into the village. And the entire village would line up across the roadway, barring the way to the family home. And they would take a broken pot or urn or something like that, and they would fill it with rubbish from the village and burnt corn, and broken pottery, and anything else that was useless and broken, and they'd put it into that pot, and they'd stand in front, and they would enact the ceremony called the Ketsetsa. They would take this pot of useless, broken rubbish, and they would cast it onto the ground at the feet of this wayward child. They would go scattering across the roadway, and they would say, Ketsetsa, you are banned forever. We are protecting your family from you ever coming back and humiliating them again. You are dead, you are gone, you are banished, go. That's the background of the story. The reason that the father sees his son while he was still a long way off is because every day the father has got up and he searched the horizon for his boy. Every day he's got out of bed and he doesn't know which direction the sun has gone, north, south, east, west. So he can't journey north because the sun might have gone south. He can't go east because he might have gone west and so on. So every day the father would get up and he would stand on the tallest, the highest point of their land. And he would look out to all points of the compass every day to see if he can get a glimpse of his boy. Because this is the father's heart. If he can find his son, and if he can run to his son, and if he can get to his boy and welcome him home and forgive him before the villagers can enact the Kitsetsa ceremony, then the entire village has to welcome him home. The entire village has to come around him with open arms and give him forgiveness. And so this is a story of a father who was searching for his son day after day after day with a heart full of longing to extend grace and forgiveness to this young boy who never deserved it. And the father sees him in the distance. And the father does something that a Middle Eastern father, a patriarch, would never, ever do. And when Jesus said it, once again, the audience would have gasped. He says, the father picked up the robes of his, uh, the, the edges of his robe, and he ran. He ran to his boy. 
It was one of the most humiliating things a Middle Eastern father could do, and this father didn't care. He didn't care how many people saw him. He didn't, how many, he didn't care how many people looked at him and thought, what is he doing? He wanted to get to his boy, and he wanted to welcome him home. He wanted to extend to him forgiveness. He wanted to extend to him grace. He said, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter the debt you owe. You are welcome, and you are loved. And this is the distinctiveness of the teaching of Jesus. See, the rabbis in Jesus' day, those religious leaders standing on the, on the edges of the crowd with a scowl on their face, they believed that God would forgive a repentant sinner. That's not the point of the story. What was revolutionary in the story is that God was this God of unbelievable grace who would search for rebellious, wayward sons and welcome them home. And so in the story, the, son, the father has got to his son before the village, put his arms around him, kissed him, hugged him, and the son begins his speech in verse 21. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But he only gets halfway through his speech because his father interrupts him. He can't even pull out his grand plan of working his way back into love. Instead, the father interrupts him and he calls to the servants in verse 22. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Whose was the best robe in the house? The father's robe. Put my robe on my boy. Put a ring on his finger, the family signet ring of authority, that he represents our family regardless of what he's done. Put sandals on his feet because he's not a servant, he's a landowner. And bring the fattened calf, that one special beast we have saved for a most important celebration. Kill the fattened calf. Let's have a feast and let's celebrate. Because the son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. See, this is the key idea of the story that Jesus is teaching. The God of grace goes looking for the lost. The God of grace goes looking for the lost. And lost people don't have to clean their lives up in order to come to God for forgiveness. They don't have to sort out the mess and pay back the debt and clean themselves up and then come to God. No, no, God invites us to come just as we are. And the brokenness and the mess and the sin and the rebellion, and he says, let me clean you up. Let me cover you with my robe. Let me welcome you back into the family. And, and now I, I do want to see obedience. I do want to see good works. But that's not to earn my love. You have my love. That's grace. Now I want you to respond to my grace out of utter amazement that this is what I would be like. It's a beautiful story of a God of grace who goes looking for the lost. And sometimes this is where we stop and we celebrate that this is what God is like. But there's still eight more verses in this story. Because what's remarkable about this story is that when, the, when it was talking about the sheep, it was one sheep that was lost and 99 were not. And when it came to the coins, it was one coin that was lost, but the other nine were not. But in this story, it's not one boy that's lost. It's both boys. It's both sons. Because here's what's happened next as Jesus continues the story. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the oldest son was out in the field. And when he came near to the house at the end of a hard day's work, he heard music and dancing and celebration. I bet he smelt that fattened calf. And he called one of the servants and asked, what is going on? And the servant replies, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go into the party. And so his father went out and pleaded with him. So imagine this scene. Remember, this family is wealthy. Their, their home would have been large. And it was probably packed not only with the family, but with the entire village. That village that would have enacted that ceremony, they're now there celebrating the homecoming because they have to. The fathers welcome the son home. So they now all have to welcome him home as well. 
And so there is this great celebration. And then one of the servants comes in and he whispers to another servant who whispers to another servant. And slowly the word filters through the hall, through the room. The oldest son is out there and he's refusing to come in. And slowly the word filters to the front of the room where the father is. And the father hears. His older son is now publicly humiliating him in front of the village as well. The older son here, folks, is just as lost, although he's never left home. And so the father once again humbles himself in front of everyone in the room. And you wonder if the music has died down and the, and the air is quiet. The father stands to his feet and he walks through the crowd and everyone knows where he's going. He's going to talk to his other lost son. And he comes out to the son and he pleads with him to come in. And notice the words of the oldest son in verses 29 and 30. He answered his father, look, all of these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. But you never even gave me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. And then when the son of yours, notice he's not my brother, he's your son. When the son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, he doesn't even know that, he's making all this up now. But when the son of yours comes home, you fill a, kill a fattened calf for him. Now notice something very carefully in the words of this older son now. He squandered, but I have slaved. Do you know what the older son has just done? What he spelt out? D-O. Father, I do this, and I do this. And I do this, and I do this, and I do this. Look at my long checklist. I've done everything you wanted. Surely you love me more than him. You see, both boys think the way to the heart of the father is spelled D-O. And what this oldest son needs to realize, just like the younger son needed to realize, is that the love of the father is spelled D-O-N-E. Because grace is not based on what you and I do. It is based on what Jesus alone has done for us. And we put our faith in him and celebrate that. So the story ends this way with the words of the father in verse 31. My son, he says, you're always with me. And everything I have is now yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad. Because this father of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is now found. How does this older son respond? Look at verse 33. There is no verse 33. Because again, see, Jesus is the master storyteller. How does this older boy respond? What's he going to say? We don't know. Do you know why? Because as Jesus is speaking to this crowd of younger sons and younger daughters who have totally messed their lives up, and Jesus wants them to know about the grace of his Father, at the back of the crowd there's a bunch of older sons and older daughters who think they've got it all together and have got a long checklist of everything they've done right and who think that the way to God is through what they do. And so Jesus is throwing this story at them. And saying, these younger, this crowd that's coming to me, who've made a mess of their lives, they know they're lost. That's why they're coming to hear me. They want to know the, this grace. But you're just as lost, you Pharisees. These younger sons and daughters are lost through their rebellion. But you, older sons and daughters, you're lost through your religion. Younger sons and daughters have given in to sinful pleasure. The problem is that older sons and daughters have given in to sinful morality. And the grace of God is available and extends to all of us, whether we have lived a life 
of incredibly bad deeds or whether we've lived a life of wonderfully good deeds. Because the truth of the matter is, we are all lost. We've all lost our way. We've all rebelled against our Creator. We've all messed up our lives. We've all failed to live up to what God calls us to do. And the God of grace, my friends, goes looking for the lost, whether they're rebellious or religious. The God of grace goes looking for the lost, whether they are rebellious or religious. And we need to hear this story. Because for many of us, our backgrounds may be that we are younger sons and daughters like that younger son. And we've wasted our lives. We've squandered what God has given us. We've headed away to a faraway country, gone far away from the things of God. And maybe that's some of you. That's your story. That maybe you are here today and that's been your recent story. Maybe this is the first time you've even slipped back into a church in a long, long time. And here's the question if you're a younger son and daughter. Am I so bad? Have I failed so much that I am beyond God's love and grace and forgiveness? And the answer is absolutely not, friends. We can never sin so greatly that we are beyond the grace of God. Because that's grace. Grace isn't spelt D-O based on what I do. Grace is spelt D-O-N-E because it's based on what Jesus has done for us in living the perfect life we couldn't live and in dying on the cross for our sins to pay the penalty of our brokenness and our rebellion and rising again from the dead to triumph over sin and death and to prove that his, his death was enough for whatever we have done. Now, this is also a story for the religious among us, for those of us who have been in church all our lives, who have ticked all the right boxes, who have done all the right things, who have never lived lives of rebellion, who have never wandered far from God. The truth is that we all wander far from God in our hearts, even if we've never left the house. True? And this message that Jesus so powerfully shared is a message that every one of us need, this amazing grace, whether we're rebellious or whether we're religious. You are never bad enough that you are beyond the grace of God, and you are never good enough that you do not need his grace. A number of years ago, Rochelle and I were visiting a town in New Zealand our church had sent one of our key leadership couples to this town, their hometown, about five hours out of Auckland, the main city where we live. And they'd started a branch, a daughter church for us, just this little church gathering meeting in their home. And so this one particular weekend, Rochelle and I went down to this town to spend the weekend with this wonderful couple and to enjoy church with them in their home. And that day, as we gathered about 25 of us maybe in this little living room of a house, I was sitting on the floor and I preached this story. I shared the story of God's amazing grace. And at the end of the, the message, I, I prayed and the, the service was over. Some of the people got up to prepare lunch. We were going to eat lunch together. And one of their daughters had been sitting through that whole service. She'd grown up in a Christian home, had made a, a commitment to Jesus, and then had wandered far away from it for a number of years. And she was sitting, I can still see it, I can picture myself in this living room. She was sitting off to my right. She sat through this whole service, and at the end of the service, as people get up and start milling around and chatting and going getting lunch, she just, she was sitting on the floor over there, and she just kind of scooted over, crawled across the floor to come and sit right next to me. This, this family is like family to us. She's like my niece. And she sits there and she looks at me. And she had tears in her eyes and she says, Brad, I, I want to do it. And I knew exactly what she meant, but I pretended I didn't. God forgive me. 
I said, what is it you want to do? She said, I want to come back to Jesus. I had the privilege of praying with this beautiful young woman, like a niece to me, and helping her come back to the God who'd never given up looking for her. And as I think about the story that Jesus tells, I think about that scene in that little house in that town in New Zealand. Two people sitting next to each other. She's this younger daughter, rebellious, wandering, gone far from home, who's now come back because the father never gave up looking for her. And grace is spelled D-O-N-E. And sitting next to her was an older son who'd never left home. That was me. Religious. Good. You know, the son of an old church elder. But it was many years before I understood the message of grace. That God did not love me because of what I did. God did not give me grace through Jesus because I checked off a list. God didn't reward me with a relationship with him because I I, I did all these things. No, no, no. She needs grace as a younger daughter, and I needed grace as an older son. And the God of grace had come looking for both of us. And at different times in our journeys, we were both found. And the angels of heaven celebrated because the God of grace goes looking for the lost, both rebellious and religious. My friends, my hunch today is that there is a number of younger sons and daughters sitting here. And you've wandered from God. You've rebelled. You've done things that you now look at and are ashamed of. And you wonder deep down, can God really forgive me for what I've done? Is is God really willing to welcome me back? Have I done too much to be beyond his grace? And I want you to understand today on the words of Jesus, you are never bad enough to be beyond his grace. But there's also today a number of older sons and daughters sitting here, aren't there? And we've always done the right things. We've always been the good kids. We've always ticked the right boxes and have never left the house. But we've been lost too. Lost in our pride. Lost in our sinful morality. Lost in a list that made us think We don't actually even need God's grace, and we desperately do. So you're never bad enough to be beyond the grace of God, but you are never good enough to not need his grace. And I believe that there are a number of you here today who are younger sons and daughters. You've rebelled. And there are older sons and daughters who have been lost in their religion. And all of us need his grace. So I want to pray for us today. But as we do that, I want to invite you, if you need to get right with God today, whether you're religious or rebellious, it doesn't matter. His grace is available. So I wonder if you would bow your heads with me. And in this moment of quiet, I want to invite you to respond to the God of grace if he is calling you today. If you're sensing the prompting of his spirit right now, I want to invite you to do something that can be very scary, but it's run into the arms of the Father who's been looking for you. I want to invite you, if you need to come today, leave your rebelliousness behind or leave your religion behind, I want to invite you to come to the front. Just stand and come forward as a way of demonstrating that you You want to embrace this grace that God has given you. If that's you, 
If he's tugging on your heart, I want to invite you to come. And I also want to invite you are under tremendous pressure in your life. If you need his grace because you have a relationship that is broken and needs his healing touch. If you're sick today and you would like prayer for that. Whatever you need, I just want to give you this moment, maybe 30 seconds. If you would like to be prayed for today, if you need the grace of God in any way, I invite you to come. Father God, we stand before you today thankful for your grace. Lord, whether we've been rebels and have run far from you, whether we've been good kids and religious and stayed in your house, it doesn't matter. We so need your grace. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who have been brave enough to come running to you because you're running to them with arms wide open welcoming them home. Thank you that no matter what they've done, your grace is available to them. Thank you that we can be a child of God, not because of what we do, but because of what you have done for us, Jesus. We commit them to your grace today. We celebrate, Jesus, all that you have done for us. And we pray for each of these men and women here that your grace would meet them right where they're at, whatever their need is. Jesus, we commit them to you. And we say thank you for your grace in your name. Amen.